Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you what we've been doing the last 13 years, studying how we humans came to be. You could look at that story as how Homo became sapiens. What is the advantage of being human what, and what is so remarkable about the human brain? But today I'm going to tell you a different version of that story, how Homo became culinarius, not sapiens, not the knowing human, but the cooking human, and what that has to do with our story and what, how we came to be here, and how cooking is so incredibly transformative for our evolutionary history, but also for our diet and our culture. So we can start with what was in the textbooks when I first became interested in figuring out how we humans compare to other species. You opened any textbook about 10 years ago, and what you would find was something like this, some facts about humans. That um, we have 100 billion neurons and 10 to 50 times as many glial cells in our brain. That brain, by the way, is five to seven times bigger than expected for the size of our body. It also costs an inordinate amount of energy. Um, even though the brain is only 2% of the mass of the body, it costs up to 25% of all the energy that sustains your body per day. Um, part of that extraordinariness of the brain would come from the fact that it has supposedly the most developed cerebral cortex, the part of the brain that is really involved with putting information together and making our behavior much, much more than just uh, receiving stimuli and responding to those stimuli. And um, there was also this notion that the human brain takes much longer to develop than any other brain. Our childhood is protracted, and that would um, also be another extraordinary feature of human brains, giving us more time to absorb culture to absorb information from the environment. So you put that all together and what we have is this view that we're special. The rules of biology, the rules of evolution supposedly did not apply to our species. Um, but by turning brains into soup, which by the way, you don't eat, um, the, but if you dissolve brains in detergent, which is what we started doing in my lab 14 years ago, you can easily find out how many cells different brains are made of. And doing that systematically to a number of species, including human brains, what we found was that the human brain actually has 86 billion neurons and only just as many glial cells. And although that may seem uh, close enough to 100 billion, um, the difference is an entire baboon brain. And the most important important part is that those 86 billion neurons and just as many glial cells makes our human brain just what you would expect of a generic primate brain of its size. We also found that it is exactly as large as you would expect for its number of neurons in a generic primate that's not a great ape, so nothing out of the ordinary there either. It also costs just as much energy as you could expect for its number of neurons, and its cortex is also just as large as you would expect for its number of neurons. And finally, it turns out that uh, our childhood is exactly as long as it should be once more for the number of neurons that we have in the cerebral cortex. So we're not special, we're really just that generic scaled up primate. The rules of biology do apply to us, but there is something remarkable about humans. There is a human advantage, as I named my book, and that is that thanks to the fact that we are primates and simply that, well, plus a little something extra that I'll come to in just a moment. Um, because we are primates and because we came to be the primate with the largest brain, we have the most neurons in the cerebral cortex of any species. So if you consider that neurons are the basic information processing units of brains, and if you consider that the cerebral cortex is that particular part of the brain that has the connections that, in, that, that allow it to receive all that information, put everything together, and use your past experiences to make predictions for the future and make plans for the future, whoever has the most neurons in the cerebral cortex 
should have the most capabilities of putting things together and planning for the future and um, figuring out how to do that, and that is us. So you see that we have many more neurons in the cerebral cortex, even than elephants that have a brain that's the size of my forearm, that's three times the size of our brain. Um, so there's an important difference in numbers, and that's really, really um, important because for the longest time, not only did we used to think of ourselves as an exception in nature, we also thought of ourselves as the creature, the one species that could do a number of things that nobody else could. Things like uh, be, being able to use symbols to represent ideas, using symbols to represent sounds that represent ideas, that's language, using symbols to represent quantities, numerosities, that's the basis of math, making tools, using those tools for numerous ends, being able to recognize ourselves in the mirror, being able to infer what other people are thinking, being able to to create a theory of other people's minds, which is the basis for deception. You can only deceive somebody if you can infer what it is that they are thinking, and that's how you manipulate what they think, besides the obvious logical reasoning and planning. But the more people have turned to other animals and studied other animals, the more they came to realize that those are really not human-specific abilities. This was Alex the parrot. Alex got intensive schooling from Irene, um, her, his um, owner, and Alex learned symbols, learned to use, make controlled use of words to convey what he wanted. Um, great apes can be taught to use sign language. They can communicate what they, what they want as well. Crows are able to fashion their own tools and use those tools to solve problems. They can also recognize themselves in the mirror and inspect a mark that is placed on them. And they can, of course, have all sorts of deceiving behaviors like planning for the future, putting together uh, a stash of rocks to pelt that particular caretaker in the zoo that you don't like the day that he shows up. So you see that what we have here is, are really differences of quantity, not quality. And I'll just illustrate um, how other animals are capable of doing things that we like to think of as really purely human. By, I'll show you, uh, I'll show you um, a short video of Ayumu, a chimpanzee in um, Research Institute in Japan. Ayumu has free access to a video game. And it's a simple video game. You probably played it in your phone a few years ago when it was really uh, a fad. You're, what you're going to see is numbers from 1 to 9 flash on the screen very rapidly. And they're immediately covered by blank squares. And what Ayumu has to do is touch the numbers in ascending order from 1 to 9 where the squares now cover them. See if you could do that. Could you beat Ayumu? So, it doesn't matter whether or not Ayumu understands that the squibbles mean one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. What matters is that she can identify them. She can under, she understand she understands that there's a hierarchy to the numbers, and she understands that there's a rule that she has to she has figured out this rule and she has to follow it. So it's all there. All the capabilities are there and the difference in whether you, you see those capabilities turn into actual abilities or not is schooling. It's what you do with your brain. A Yumu had, has how hours per day to play with this game. If you let humans play as much as, as she did, humans get just as good as a chimpanzee. Um, but back to our evolutionary history. So what we have here is that we are that species that has the most neurons in the cerebral cortex, therefore the most information processing capabilities, even though we are not the species with the largest brain. And again, that's simply because we are primates. And there is something that seems extraordinary in how we got to 
here, which is that if you look at the fossil record, you see that from that ancestor that we share with chimpanzees about six million years ago, with a brain that was already about the size of a chimpanzee brain today, you see that the human brain increased in size extraordinarily fast and by an extraordinary amount. It tripled in size in essentially one and a half million years. Um, and so here are our questions. How come we are the only species that shows such a fast increase in brain size, making us the only species with this many neurons in the cerebral cortex? And the answer um, appeared once we started uh, worrying about great apes, how come they are bigger than us, so you would expect them to have bigger brains than we do, and yet it's the other way around. They're bigger, but we have the largest brain and the largest cerebral cortex. Our brain is three times the size of a gorilla or orangutan brain. Um, it turns out that once we could count neurons, we realized that neurons are incredibly expensive. And they're, exp they're expensive by number, not by mass. So what you have here is that in terms of numbers of neurons, this is us here. So you see that uh, we have just as many neurons as you would expect for our body mass if you compare us to, other, to the other red dots, which are other primates. And you see that our brain actually costs just as much energy as it would as you would expect for its number of neurons. It just costs a lot of energy because it has a lot of neurons. So it's 500 kilocalories on average for our 86 billion neurons in a day. Now, when we did the math and we considered um, what would happen if we ate like any other primate still eats to this day out there in nature, um, if you do the math, of how much, how many calories they get per day. Um, and I just lost the signal. There. If you do the math of how many, cal how many calories they can get per hour that they spend eating, you could see that a generic primate that spent eight hours per day, eight solid hours per day, every single day, looking for food and eating, the most that that primate could afford in its brain would be 53 billion neurons. And in that case, there would only be energy left to feed a body of 25 kilos. For that primate body to be any bigger, it would have to give up neurons. It's either or. When you eat like a primate, you either have a lot of neurons or you have a very large brain. If you become too large, there isn't any energy left anymore to even afford one neuron. So um, primates cannot be very large, especially given that they have to sleep about eight to nine hours per day. So this is where we find orangutans and gorillas in that uh, 75 kilogram range with 30 billion neurons. And you see that we humans with 86 billion neurons, we should really not be here. We are not viable. We would not be viable if we ate like any other primate does out there. What changed everything? What changed our evolutionary history? What changed our diet and our culture for the, the remaining one and a half million years of our history was cooking. And by cooking, I mean, I, I use the word cooking in the most extensive generic way possible, which is to mean any kind of transformation that you do to your food before you put it in your mouth, any kind of pre-processing of food before you eat it. And cooking then starts with stone tools. Three million years ago, we were, our ancestors were bipedal already, and they could use, they could fashion stone tools that they could then use to carve skin out of animals to get to the flesh, to cut flesh, to make it thus much easier to eat, but also to cut roots, to cut through stems, to pound them, to crush them. All of that, all of those uh, manipulations consist of pre-processing your food or pre-digesting your food, if you will, before you put it in your mouth. And then, of course, there was the use of fire. Once you, um, about one million years ago, once you can apply fire to what you eat before you put it in your mouth, the transformation is even more extreme. 
And um, as the food is pre-digested by fire or pounding or by acids, it becomes softer, easier to chew. That means that you can um, chew it eat more uh, rapidly and easily in your mouth. You can turn it into a complete pulp that you can then swallow. And once it gets to your digestive tract, it gets completely destroyed by enzymes. And therefore, you get 100% caloric yield. So the consequence of cooking is that um, you can now eat more in less time and also get more calories from the same food, which means that you now have free time. You no longer have to spend nine hours per day every single day looking for food and eating. You can go out and do other things with those neurons that you have. And that is how I've proposed that uh, our evolutionary history changed by, uh, by having this first technology that humans created stone uh, tools and cooking implements, cooking tools, um, have, uh, having a large brain go from being a liability, a risk really, to being an asset. And with that and the free time that became available, now we could both afford a large number of neurons and be able to do something interesting with them. And that is the simplest explanation I can think of for how come our species and only our species, the cooking one, became the one with uh, uh, the ability to afford such a large number of neurons, especially in the cerebral cortex that nobody else can. Let me just put that into context for you. So we should eat nine and a half hours per day. That means forget going to school, forget being here talking about what we do or how we do it and how to do it better. No, 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 we would have to be out there looking for food all the time. Um, so, and even then, we still dedicate about two hours per day to foods. If you're an elephant, you have to spend 18 hours per day eating. Your waking life is thinking about food and consuming food. So cooking changed everything. Um, we sometimes forget how that changes things. We just take it for granted. So let me tell you a little bit about what is so transformative about cooking other than giving us plenty of calories. You, you, can, you can take these raw ingredients, which are edible to some extent. We have transformed corn, for instance, to an enormous amount even before we realized that that was genetic manipulation. By cooking, you can transform these raw foods into things that are extremely um, caloric, which is good to a certain point, but there are also incredibly taste here. You can take dry cocoa beans that are just bitter and hard, and if you bake them and, count and pound them and do some other transformations to them, you get this delicious, rich cream that you can put in your mouth and it's so pleasing. And the reason why it's so pleasing and the reason why cooking works so well is that what we appreciate about food is, it's, is actually its flavor, not its taste. Taste is just what the brain gets as information about the nutrients that you get in your in that you're putting inside your body. Is it sugars? Is it proteins? Is it salts? Is it acids? That's what taste gives you. But flavor is actually a combination of all that plus the texture, plus the smell, plus the sight of what you see. So taste depends on the actual stimulus, the actual stuff that you put in your mouth. Flavor is what your brain builds out of all that information. And pleasantness, that the pleasure that you get out of that is variable. A lot of that pleasure comes from fat. And that is really important, that fat is so pleasurable to our brains because fat is by gram, per gram, fat is the best source of energy. You, you get nine kilocalories per gram instead of four kilocalories per gram of uh, carbohydrates or proteins. Fat is also fundamental. There are a number of fatty acids that our body requires to live that we cannot produce. We, our body does not know how to produce them, and we get them from food. Um, 
the, all those calories and all those benefits come with the added bonus of the pleasure that you get from that slick texture of fatty foods in your mouth. And that is important to the point where if you use a neutral stimulus, if you, if you can touch a metal electrode to, your, to the tip of your tongue and you taste a neutral um, taste, but if you pair that with just the sight of a delicious steak, with the sight of highly caloric food, your brain actually thinks that you have something delicious in your mouth. That is how important um, fat is in the sight of, of highly caloric foods, or to the point that you don't even need to understand calories or to understand what you need to appreciate high caloric content food, or cooked food for that matter. If you op offer great apes the option of having um, raw foods now or cooked foods later, most of them will go for the cooked foods later. And so do we. And that is great. It's just that there's, there's this slight problem that um, it's now become too easy because we have the crafts to overdo the cooking, and um, we also have carbohydrates on tap, which we didn't use to have in, back in the days when our ancestors were hunt, hunt, hunter-gatherers or even the first farmers. That means that all those, the, where, whereas a, a tall glass of milk will give you a good number of calories, and even if you transform those chocolate, those bitter chocolate uh, seeds into dark, rich chocolate, fat, is sates your, your hunger so easily that you'll be content with just enough calories, with just a little bit of that high-fat chocolate, but once you've loaded your food with carbohydrates, then it actually becomes really easy to overeat really fast. And so we have it. Our history of uh, going from being able to transform our foods to actually then having a culture, agriculture, civilization, supermarkets, electricity to keep all that food, refrigerators to keep all that food so we never run out of it, and actually you can now get all those calories that you need in just 15 minutes at the corner junk food store of your preference, which means that we now grapple with the, the opposite problem of having too much to eat. And the irony of it all is that we then come back to, because we can, eating raw foods as a solution. Um, so, I'll wrap up here, and if you ask me what is the human advantage, what do we do that nobody else does, is we cook extensively. Other animals do pre-process their food, but nobody does it like we do. And that is what allowed us to have the largest number of neurons in the cerebral cortex, which in turn allowed us to be here, even talking about food and how cooking is important. And um, what the... Ah, Wi-Fi. See, we have all these neurons and still the connectivity goes away. And then what you do. That's why I still like paper. <laughs> Jesus, it just went away. Can you just tap that, the screen for me? Once? Oh, there. Sorry, so there we go. Um, we're the one species that cooks extensively, which afforded us the largest number of neurons that we have in the cerebral cortex, largest than, than anybody else. And now we have the exclusive problem of um, having to deal with technology. The problem is not technology, and I use the word technology to refer to cooking as well. Cooking is a technology. It is a means to solve problems. The problem with cooking is with any other technology is to use it right, to make sure that it is accessible to everyone and also to make sure that we make mindful use of it. Thank you very much for your attention.